Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven, and today we're bringing the pick and place to life. I know last time it was moving around and picking components, but that was just me sending dumb g-code to it that I wrote by hand. It wasn't intelligent, it wasn't doing it based off of a design file for a PCB, but today we're gonna do that and we're gonna use OpenPNP. I talked about this in a previous video, but it's pretty much a piece of software that lets you import some design files for a PCB, and then it figures out how to control the pick and place in order to make those boards. It's super cool, awesome software, and it's totally open source. Now before I get OpenPMP connected to this sucker and get it all configured and calibrated, I need to do a few things. The first is getting the feeders to electrically connect to the piggyback board. The way I'm gonna do this is with something I'm calling the feeder floor. It's a little PCB and printed part assembly that I designed that mounts underneath the feeder rail. And then when you slide a feeder into it, it makes electrical contact that lets it talk back to the piggyback. It needs to be able to slide in and out really easily. So I'm using something called spring fingers. And they're pretty much just these really tiny electrical contacts that are a little flexible. And then when these four little spring connections touch these four pads on the feeder PCB, ha ha, it makes electrical connection. Sick. This is literally the entire schematic. <laughs> That's it. And this is the actual board. It's so tiny. To the mill. So what I actually use for milling these boards are just these copper clad blanks. You can get these on Amazon or eBay or whatever. It's just a little rectangle of FR4 fiberglass with copper on one side of it. And then to hold it down, I just have this roll of carpet tape that I got on Amazon. It's super sticky and it holds the board down, no problem. Well, look at that little board. It's so cool. So this is the feeder floor PCB. Just like 10 minutes ago, I showed you into the computer and now it's real. Ah, oh, it's so cool. So this is the board and this is the little printed piece. And they go together like this, bloop. Then there's a nice little place for the feeder to boop, go right in there and make its connections. And there it is. I can just slide the feeder in and it just makes contact with the pads on that inside PCB. No more dangly wires hanging off feeders. You just pop it in. It's connected. It's talking back to the piggyback. It's got power. It's got everything it needs. This isn't really just a feeder connector. It's a connector for anything you want to attach to this machine. As long as it talks ring, it's set to go. You're ready to talk to it and have it interface with your pick and place somehow. Ho ho ho. What a satisfying click. Sick. All right, so now that we got the feeder all wired up to the piggyback board, it's time to get ring working. <laughs> get it talking between the feeder and the piggyback, sending data back and forth, and not just me doing little scribbles on the whiteboard, but actually doing it in hardware. So to test that, I made this little thing. It's literally just two Arduino Nanos wired up with ground and then clo and dat, the two lines you need for a ring. That's it. That's the only way that they're 
talking to each other in any way. And the scripts that I have on them right now, the sender just sends a certain byte of data to the receiver and then the receiver prints that out just to see how well the data is going across. It still needs some tuning, but you can actually see the bits going back and forth. That diagram I drew two videos ago, you can actually see it on the scope. It's so cool. So let's get it wired up. All right, so here's my setup. I got my computer connected to both of these Arduinos over USB so I can listen into the serial port and see what's going on in their heads. I've also got the Clo and DAT lines connected to my oscilloscope so I can see what is actually electrically happening on them while this whole thing is running. So the sender Arduino on startup, it sends out one byte. So I just press reset to have it do it again. And then the receiving Arduino, I have a serial port open on my computer and it will read out whatever it sees come in over ring. So I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna send a byte over. I'm also gonna put my scope in a single capture mode, which instead of just kind of constantly showing its stream of consciousness of whatever is coming in on all of its channels, it'll actually only just capture one single frame of what you see on the screen. So you can take a peek at it a little bit more in depth, look at all the different signals and stuff like that, instead of just kind of being a constant feed. I'm going to press this and it's going to send it. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. That's it right there. This is pretty much exactly what I drew on the whiteboard two episodes ago. Oh, and there it is on my serial port too. Oh, that's so cool. So I just sent 01010101 just to test to make sure that the highs and lows and everything are working. All right, so if we just zoom in here a little bit, we can take a closer look at what is going on. So the top yellow line is clock and the bottom is data. This tiny little yellow blip right here, this is the sender saying, hey, I have a message to send. And then immediately after, because the receiver isn't doing anything, it says, hey, I hear you, I'm ready for the message, and it pulls that line low, and then they both come back up. This right here is the entire beginning part of everyone agreeing it's time for a message to be sent. That's right here, and then this is the data. At this point, the sender is running the whole show. The blue line is the data, so first it pulls low for a zero, sends out a clock pulse, and then the receiver knows the zero is the first bit. Then it pulls data high and puts out another clock pulse, so the receiver knows the second bit is a one, and it just keeps on doing that. And this is the fabled ninth clock pulse. That is the receiver saying, yep, I got your message. I'm pulling data low to confirm I got it all. And that's it. It feels so cool to get this whole thing that's just kind of been floating around in my head and only been in code, sending information back and forth between microcontrollers. Uh, it's, it's very satisfying. The first time I pressed the reset button and I saw all the bits go across, oh, it was so cool. It was so cool. So now I just need to take this bare bones like proof of concept and then fit it into all the firmware for the feeders and the piggyback so they can actually use it to send important data like, hey, move the tape forward three pips and not just 10101 or whatever. That little nugget is the whole bite. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so cool. The next thing I have to do is make a whole bunch of feeders to test with. And I've got this guy, but if I'm making a whole bunch, I might as well test out a new revision and try some changes and see how they work out. So, look at these things. Oh, they're so much smaller than the original. Look at that. Oh, it's such a better form factor. Plus, I'm pretty sure I forgot to specify the coding I wanted on all the pads. So they just kind of came out this like really wild, eerie orange color. I think it's just the copper that has been oxidized a little bit from just being out in the air, or they just put some kind of bare bones protective coating on it. Plus if I was buying boards, I figured I might as well try that new revision of the indexing wheel and get them gold plated. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna zoom on in here. Pretty freaking cool, huh? Whew. For those of you with keen eyes in the last feeder video, you might have seen, oh, my print's starting. Oh boy, oh no. You might have seen there was a tiny little switch on the feeder PCB, and you might have guessed that that is actually for detecting when the tape has run out. I want the feeder to be able to realize when there's no more tape and let OpenPMP know so I can stop the job and wait for someone to come and replace a new spool. It didn't work, 
at all. And anyway, it was a total failure. The switch didn't come off the PCB enough to actually get triggered by the tape. So now I found a new switch and hopefully it will see the tape run out and be able to let me know with some blinking lights and sending it back to OpenPNP and generally raising the alarm. Also, I am a little worried about this working reliably. So I added a little jumper on the PCB labeled TDO for tape detection override. And you can just short that out with solder and it will override the switch. Just in case it's problematic, I wanna be able to disable it. It's free to add it to the board, so there's no reason to not add selectable jumpers like that. You're just giving yourself options down the road. There's really no harm in adding something like that. So I try and add jumpers and test points and stuff like that if I think I might ever possibly need it. On goes the switch. I am a big ball of sad. Uh. I didn't change the basic drive system from the first version, but I did make some changes to the way that the film was hopefully gonna peel off. And I just kind of figured it would work this time. <laughs> As I say that now out loud, it seems so naive. And guess what? It doesn't work. When I try and drive forward the tape, if I don't worry about the film at all, it's great. It's just like the first version. It indexes tape beautifully, no problem. Super happy about that. But every time I try and put the film over this X-Acto knife blade, which is supposed to kind of like slice one half of the film off of the tape and guide it up around so then also can come and pick up the part, it just jams. There isn't enough oomph in the motor to kind of push the tape into the blade and have the film peel up. It just doesn't have enough power. Oh my God. No. We were supposed to be done with the feeders. We were supposed to be finished. <laughs> uh. I was up until 3 a.m. last night, desperately trying to find a solution to peel the film, and I did. I am so excited. I went hunting around my shop trying to find some kind of motor that might be able to put out the force that I need, but is also still in a pretty small form factor, and I found one of these. I'm not sure exactly what this motor is called, but it's typically used in like RC cars. It's a small little like three to six volt DC motor with a big old gearbox on the end of it. It gears it up or down. It gears the torque up and the speed down a ton. So this output is super torquey. And then I committed some of the worst atrocities. Please don't judge me for this. There's a lot of super glue in what you're about to see. I printed this tiny little adapter that I just super glued onto the board and it peels the film without a problem. This motor just drives the tape right into the blade and whoop, just lifts it right up. No issues whatsoever. It just plows it on through. This is good enough to test open PMP. I'm gonna call it good for right now. The next time I order feeder boards, I'm gonna redo it specifically for this motor because that is wicked jank. <sighs> so we've got feeder floors, we got ring working, and we got working feeders. The time has come for open PNP. I am super excited to dive into this and figure out how to use it. So let's boot up the glow tie PCB and make some glow ties. <laughs> Where is it going? <laughs> oh, is it gonna place it? Come on. <laughs> it kind of works. It 
kind of works. What the heck? <laughs> See how bad this is? Oh yeah, that's true precision right there. But it freaking works! My pick and place is picking and placing. I have components on a board that my pick and place put there and I did not hard code the positions in. Oh, it, it's just, it's heartbreaking because this looks exactly like what you saw at the end of the last video, but it is so different. The last video I just hard coded positions in and it picked them and put them down. But this is like, programmatically doing that, which is a whole other beast with a whole slew of problems that come along with it. This is MVP, right? Like every feature that this thing needs to have works, at least a little bit. And now it's just improving all those features to make it more reliable and work better and faster and all that stuff. <laughs> and it doesn't work great, but all the problems that it has can be tuned out or upgraded in some smaller way, not a fundamental redesign. It's just tweaking and tuning from here. Easily the most difficult part of this episode was getting the piggyback board to understand a command from OpenPMP and figure out what to do with it and then get a response back from the feeder and then send it back up to OpenPMP. That was a freaking that was nuts. If I'm an OpenPMP and I say index feeder zero, two pips, OpenPMP has a specific G code command that I told it to send based on what I'm asking it to do to index a feeder. It looks at all the different serial ports open, decides which one it should send it to, sends it to that one. The piggyback board gets that G code command, decides how to parse that into an actual command over ring and which feeder it should send it to, decides how to do that, does that, sends that information over ring, the feeder indexes, the feeder then sends a ring command back to the piggyback board. The piggyback board then interprets that ring command, decides how to send that back to OpenPMP over G code and sends it back over G code. <sighs> and all that happens whenever I say index and it goes, all that is happening. Shepherding that into existence was... Uh. Now all the basic functionality is here, but of course this thing is not done. I have to upgrade a bunch of stuff on it, a lot of tuning and calibration I need to do. I still have to add cameras, which is a huge part of this whole thing. It works without it, but it helps so much with setting up jobs and getting really accurate placement. Plus I want to add solder paste dispensing, built-in reflow, and a conveyor belt. So still lots of stuff to do, but this is like, a unit, a done thing. Only took me eight episodes. The next video is gonna be an expose of this whole machine, showing it doing all its fancy things. Plus, it comes with the source. A ton of you have been asking me to release all the files for this thing, and with the next video comes my GitHub repository going live. There's still a lot of work to do for cleaning it up and writing all the documentation and getting the files in a state that represent what this actually is and what actually works. So in two weeks when the next video goes up, all the source will be available on my GitHub page. Lastly, I have a Patreon. There's a link in the description if you want to become a patron. My patrons directly influence these projects, so any support on Patreon is tremendously appreciated. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. There it is. That's a wrap, baby. Uh, that's a wrap. Uh, that's a wrap. Oh, Bobby. I think I broke it. <laughs>